It's great to gather again in the name of Jesus. Amen. We are here because Jesus is here. Amen. And he is waiting for our worship. Amen. So let us prepare ourselves to turn our eyes on him and worship him from our hearts. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, glory be to your name. You are the only true God. You are the great God, the glorious God, the Lord who sits on the throne, and everything is under your feet. Lord, thank you because out of your great love for us, you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross in our place. Thank you for opening the way so we can have forgiveness of sins and fellowship with you. Lord, as we gather together, we ask you, move freely among us. We ask your presence here. Let your Holy Spirit guide us. And we come expecting a new touch from you, Lord. We commit our meeting into your hands, and we want the name of Jesus to be glorified. Amen. 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 Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus.
ask the Him at this moment, fill me with your love and your joy and your grace and for everything, Father, because I know you have everything. Father, I'm the empty person. Please fill me with your joy, Daddy.
Come, Holy Spirit, fill the church. As we worship you, Lord, fill us, touch us. We offer worship to you.
So yeah, it's a real uh, blessing for us to be here. Now I'm uh, talking about something which I feel is talked far too little in the churches. And I, and I think in times like this it's really even more important to talk about this topic. Um, uh, normally this is being talked about uh, at Easter. What would the topic be, in your opinion, if we, if we talk about Easter? Yes, resurrection. <laughs> Jesus is alive, isn't he? And we are saying to each other, he is risen. He is risen. And what is your response normally on Easter? Indeed, he is risen. Yes. Um, and this is such an important fact uh, that we must not lose hold of that. Jesus himself said in uh, John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus asked Martha, do you believe this? And this morning Jesus asks you, do you believe this? Um, and actually, right then, Jesus proves that he is truly the resurrection and the life. Because, you know, I have some understanding from Martha that it's hard for her to believe this at that moment. Her brother just had died. And they called Jesus, please come quickly. Lazarus is very sick. But Jesus didn't come quickly. He spent two more days. And Martha felt well. He, Jesus, you came too late. It's done. But Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, when you look at the dead person, I mean, he was behind a rock, but when you have seen the dead person, it's not just a theoretical question. It's a very practical question as well. And Jesus went on to bring Lazarus, this brother of Martha, back to life. You know, Jesus is not just talking. What he says is true. 
and it's real. This became also very real to me this year. Beginning of June, my dad passed away. Now, this was not a surprise. He was uh, advanced in years. He was 92 years old. And he had Alzheimer, and uh, already for more than a year, we could expect the worst to happen. Now, this was very stressful for me because I was here in Cyprus and locked down, like uh, beginning 2020, for instance. During that time, my dad was not doing well. And I was really stressed out. Well, what if he dies now? How will I get to Germany? How will I be part of the, his burial? Then in summer 2020, we were in Germany and also traveling to Austria, where we have uh, also many friends. And uh, I remember we talked to uh, one uh, friend and they were saying, but you know, you can actually pray for God's hour of death for your dad. I was thinking, well, I, to pray for the death, death of my father, it looks, sounds a bit strange to me. <laughs> but uh, when I thought more about it, I felt, well, actually, yeah, that's a good idea that I pray that God will take him at the right time and in his time. And there was a bit of a selfish prayer also. I said, please take him when I can travel easily and be, be there. Because I really felt I want to be there, at least for the burial, uh, that I can say goodbye to him. My dad was a believer, so I was not afraid for him to die and go to the Lord. To make a long story short, my dad could not have uh, picked a better time to die than uh, in June. During that time, it was very easy, easy to travel to Germany. We didn't even to go, need to go into cur uh, quarantine. And um, my prayer was fulfilled. I could be there for his burial. And that was really special for me, I need to say. But what was also special was that my three siblings could be there uh, at the hour of, of his death. My, my and my... Uh, son and daughter could be there to rep represent me also at that moment. And that was a big miracle because my daughter is two hours away uh, and my son is closer, but still it was quite a miracle that they could be there. And, you know, to know, yes, Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life, and 
my dad is now with you and he has eternal life, was a lot of comfort to me and gave me a lot of hope. And that is what the gospel is all about. It's a message of hope. Again, something we talk too little about in the churches, in my opinion, uh, but it's so important to have hope, isn't it? But this hope is based on the fact that Jesus really has risen and he is a living God. Now let's uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because that is the chapter which deals at greatest length in the Bible about the question of resurrection. I will hopefully do a quick rundown of the whole chapter. Let's see how we do with time, but I will try to do that. So, uh, chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 1. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Yes. And then in verse 33 he says, in 34, Do not be misled, bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some of you who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. This is a warning that they would leave the true gospel. And then in verse 58, he says, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. In the context, Paul is talking about stay firm with this true message of the resurrection of Jesus you have believed in. This is the cornerstone of our gospel. Without that, the gospel doesn't mean anything. And you believe the nice myth, maybe, but not, it's not real. You know, in our day, there are so much so many messages, so much news and fake news and I don't know what 
And even some even circle leaders preach the gospel, I am really shocked about sometimes. Starting to question some basics of the faith, I feel. There is so much confusion in this world regarding what is really true. Even about this vaccination, there is a lot of discussion. Is this vaccination good or bad? What is behind it and who knows what? And some Christians believe it might be even the mark of the beast, you know, out of Revelation. There's so much confusion that we cannot think straight anymore, isn't it? And I have been discussing with, with people and I was shocked that you couldn't even discuss anymore with them. They were so convinced about their opinion. My truth is a true truth. So you can tell me what you want, but I know what the truth is. But what is the truth? Truth is really a revelation from God. It's not with us. Our minds are so limited. True truth, we can only know if it's revealed from God. Because he created everything and he created us as well. That's why it's not a secondary thing whether we keep hold of the true gospel or not. Because it's not just a theoretical statement, it has very practical implications. And Paul goes on to say in verse 3, For what I received I have passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and so on. Amen. Now, you know, intellectually, the gospel is not very complicated. Everyone can understand it. And here we have actually a summary in one sentence statement what the gospel is all about. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. And he was raised on the third day. Very simple. And that means that we have life, that we have forgiveness. You know, because uh, he says he died for our sins. He died for our sins. But he not only died, that somehow our, our sins are taken care of. He rose to give us life. 
ඒ වගේ Actually these scouts were put there to make sure that the disciples wouldn't steal uh, Jesus body and claim that he had resurrected. Well the guards went to the Jewish leaders and said really we have a problem. The tomb is empty, Jesus is gone. We, you know. we couldn't do anything about it. There were some angels, powerful angels coming. Uh, we didn't have a chance. Jewish leaders were consulting each other, had a meeting. We need to do something about this. This is a real problem now. So they devised a bad plan. Uh, they paid some bribes to the guards. Doesn't that sound familiar to you? Maybe, you know, bribes to bend the truth somehow? And we're saying, well, you just tell uh, your authorities, well, um, we fell asleep and actually these disciples came and sold the body. But then the God said, well, but then uh, our superiors will really punish us because we were falling asleep we, and we shouldn't have fallen asleep. So they said, oh, no problem. We talk to your superiors. It will, it will all be fine. Don't worry. You know, even in those days, People were trying to suppress the truth. Nothing new under the sun. It was a fact, but they would try to turn the fact around. And there were witnesses to this fact. More than 500 people could witness to this fact. And that's why we stand on this truth. Jesus has truly risen. However, there was a problem in the Corinthian church. Because there were some people who said, uh, this resurrection of the dead, that's fake news. That's not real. You know, this is a myth. It's, you know, this life is all there is. You know, some materialists, as we have also in our day, it didn't make sense to them. You know, to have this firm hope that we have a life in the future. That's is only true in the Christian faith. With no other religion, you have any firm hope regarding your future. You know, in Islam, the closest you can get is 
in Islam. If you die in the holy war, there is a good possibility that you end up in paradise. And then you will have all these ladies, you know, and you can have a great sex life there. I'm always wondering what paradise is that because it's only a paradise for men, not for women. <laughs> Which is unfortunately true for many religions. It's a paradise for men, not for women, somehow. But anyway, uh, but even then, if you die in the Holy War, you cannot be 100% sure that you have this life in paradise. Why can we be 100% sure? Because it doesn't depend on us what we can do and achieve. It depends on what Jesus has done for us. So there is this problem, this question coming up. Verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So this question of whether we can resurrect from the dead, cannot be separated from this question that Christ Christ has risen from the dead. If Christ has risen from the dead, we can also resurrect from the dead. If we cannot resurrect from the dead, Christ has not risen. Sounds pretty logical, doesn't it? You know, God is a logical God. Not an arbitrary God. <laughs> so, you know, either both are real or both are false. And if it's false, we have believed in a myth. I mean, Whatever preaching is being done in the churches, it's useless policy. It's for nothing. On the way here, I discussed with my wife how actually uh, um, Lutheran theologians can still hold on to the resurrection. Lutheran, uh, that's a, like a mainstream church in Germany. Reformed, Reformed church. Um, because they deny that miracles were really happening. So Lazarus, well, this story about Lazarus is, did not really happen historically. It's just a nice story to build our faith somehow. But if I deny any miracles to happen, then the resurrection couldn't have happened, very simply. 
Um, and actually, I really need to discuss that with such a theologian, how he somehow brings this together. I, I don't really understand it. So, uh, let's go on here more. Uh, 15, 16. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not raised, been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith has, is futile. You are still in your sins. So Paul is really repeating the same idea again. To make sure the Corinthians and also we really get it. Yeah, if Christ has been raised, then we also will raise to life. Verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Um, 19 as well, yes. So if Christ has not been raised, there is no life after death. Yeah. And so there is no hope for those who have already died. But it really means that there is no hope, true hope. Because if there is only hope for this life, that I may have a better salary or may build a house or whatever, what will my hope be like when I am maybe like my dad, 92 years old, and just facing death, natural death? I cannot take anything with me, not my house, not my car, not, any, not money, bank accounts. You know, if I put my hope in all this kind of stuff, at the hour of death, all this hope is gone. Most likely even earlier than that. So, true hope must point to a future beyond death. And that's why we as believers, we should be true people of hope. But so often I hear all oh, this pandemic and all this chaos in the world, it's just a sign for Jesus will come back and everything will be over soon. And people are so desperate, there's no hope. And this pandemic, it will never end. No hope. Well, who are we? We are people of hope. And we can still hope in in face of the most terrible circumstances. And that is what the gospel is all about. And if that was not true, Paul is right in saying we should be the most pitied people on earth. Because we just have believed the myth. 
Verse 20. But Christ indeed has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Yes. So Christ has been raised. He was the first one to be raised. And because he was raised, we follow. Now, actually, uh, Paul talks a, a little bit more about um, this gospel and, and this resurrection, how it's being proven. And what the consequence would be of no resurrection. Well, uh, first of all, he says, uh, as we said before, if there was no resurrection, the gospel would be wrong, false, a lie. And those who preach this gospel would be big liars as well. And in verse 29, starting in verse 29, he talks about a few aspects here as well. Now, if there's no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? Now that's a strange practice I need to say and I wonder what really Paul thought about that practice. He's just mentioning it that this was a practice, but whether that was a good idea or a bad idea, he doesn't say much, really much about that. And it's also not totally clear what they actually did in, in detail here. But possibly uh, there were some believers who died before they could receive baptism. And then some people, some believers would get themselves baptized in their place so that they also would have baptism. Some, some. You know, some other believers would be baptized for them so that they kind of would have the baptism. <laughs> well, it's a bit of a, a question mark here what, what this is all about, exactly. And then verse 30, And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? So Paul, as an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus, he is risking his life for the gospel message because he knows it's true. It's a fact. And there were others who did the same as, as he did. Actually, this is a big witness to the truth of the gospel over all the centuries.
Christians who really have this spiritual life in them. Who have met Jesus personally. Are ready to die for this reality. And again, again and again, I read about stories where people give their lives to Christ because they witnessed someone dying for Christ. And that made them think, I mean, you know, to die for something like that, I mean, it must be true for that. Otherwise, how, why would they give their lives? And Paul, when we read through Acts and also his letters, he experienced a lot of persecution for preaching the gospel. And he could have died many times because he was stoned, he was shipwrecked and so on and so on. But if the resurrection was not true, he says, if the dead are not raised, again in verse uh, 32, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's actually Greek philosophy at its best. Paul knew Greek philosophers, it seems. He, he seems to have read them. Because this is a quote of one Greek philosopher. This is a quote like and that is really uh, our philosophy of our day. And then this pandemic comes around and I cannot go out and eat and drink and just have fun. And the young people are saying, I cannot party anymore. There's no life. It's done. Really? Yeah, if you have this philosophy, this pandemic is horrible. If you cannot go out and eat and drink anymore, and uh, travel for some holidays to Cyprus or where it might be, then life is gone. I mean, that shows how poor this philosophy is, right? If that is all what is, has meaning in life, I mean, this is really not much. But that's how so many people live in our world today. I need to make out, out of this life the most I can get out of it uh, because that's all there is. Yeah, if I don't believe in a resurrection, that's it. But he says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Uh, we get back to verse 20 or actually 
For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will, will be made alive. We will talk more about Adam and Christ, uh, how they uh, compare a bit later. So in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. First Christ, who is the first fruit, it's not a separate category, it's Christ, he is the first fruit, as we learned earlier. And then when he comes, those who belong to him. And then the end will come, that is actually the end has come when Jesus returns. And then there are uh, some yeah, difficult theological concepts here. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Wow, that's good news. Death is being destroyed. It's, there's an end to death. Death will die, so to speak. <laughs> so, Christ is the ruler of the universe. And there is no question who rules this universe, especially after Jesus has died and, and resurrected. And he will have victory over all powers and also over death. Verse 27, for he has put everything under his feet, like God has put everything under God, Christ's authority. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now, I just want to emphasize what this is not saying. This is not saying that Jesus is not God and equal to God. Jesus is God. Uh, we believe in a triune God, the God the Father, the Son and the Spirit. What I understand this passage is saying is that Jesus fulfilled a specific function among these three people in the Godhead. And in the Godhead, they submit to one another in love. 
So there's no question who rules whom and so on. That's not the, the, the idea. But Jesus was happy to do what the Father wanted him to do. Which was to come in this world in human form and bring salvation to mankind. But after Jesus was raised, he is with the Father, sitting together with him on the throne. And that we learn, for instance, in Philippians, but also in Revelation. I don't have the time to go there to show that to you. So, I hope this sheds a bit of light on this passage because it's a bit of a difficult passage uh, when we first read it. So now there is another question here. Uh, which is raised in uh, verse 35. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? And then Paul says, how foolish. Now, I wouldn't think this question is totally foolish because also I would be interested to know better. <laughs> so here now Paul tries to explain what that means to be resurrected to life. And that might be a surprise to you, I don't know. But that is what Paul uh, is explaining here. He uses three analogies to explain about this new resurrection life. Actually, this resurrection body. The first analogy is in verse 37, where he uses, if you want to call it that way, botanical life. Well, when you sow, you do not plant the body that will die, uh, will be, but just a seed, perhaps, of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. So, Paul is saying, well, when you sow a seed, this seed is going to die, and New life will come out of that. So if you like, there's a transformation from one body to another one. And then uh, the second analogy is in verse uh, 39. He talks about biological life. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, fish another. So he is just pointing out there's this rea reality of different kinds of bodies. That's already true for this creation. And then he goes on with unanimated objects. 
So again, here she says, there are different kinds of bodies, and each body has its own beauty. And finally now, in verse 42, he applies this now to this question of resurrection. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead? The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. So, we have this weak body now, with all the shortcomings of it, and God will give us a new body. And Jesus proved that he appeared to people in a body. He was having breakfast and dinner with some of his disciples after he had resurrected. But obviously it was a different body because he could just appear in some closed room where the disciples had been locked up. So that's the contrast, you know, uh, between Adam and Christ. Yeah, we got an, a body like Adam had. But now with Christ, we will get a new body. Yeah, we will be, we have been in the image of Adam, but now we will be in the image of Christ. So then let's come to the conclusion Paul is drawing here. Um, he says, uh, let's start in 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks to God, He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is truly good news. We have this resurrection life. Because Christ's victory was complete. And this is proven because he resurrected from death. So what did we learn today as we were looking at this question of resurrection? Well, first of all, this gospel message is not to be changed. 
एक निशा पाले में निकाल ने तमा में सुबह रंची एक खावड़ा का वेनास फिर ने ने एक फटांगे में दिमाग तिबुनु सुबह रंची तमा दिगत माया ने। My friends, let's hold on to this truth firmly. एक निशा साहूदर साहूदर ये ने में ऐसे ही ला संपूर्ण ने में ऐसे ही ला द दाव से बाल लगाने ना जेसुस आंसे जीव मानो मालूंगे नकिट्टा Share all sorts of ideas. एक नहीं साबित है ऐसे ना विविधा कार YouTube बोलें देव कहते हो लोग विविधा कार मानुष्य कथा करने को लो ये देव वाले टर नॉर रैवेट इन नेपा. There is a huge danger that we are deceived in our day. एक नहीं साथ दाव से विशाल विनाश वाल में लोग के टापे जीवित वर्ड में काले फैमिली लाते में ना विशाल विनाश भी. That's why I have this passion that I help people be grounded in the Word of God in the Bible. Because that's the only way how we can discern. And we learn that Jesus not only died but he raised to life. हम एक निशा आपे पानी भी दिया तो सुबह आरंचे ना जैसे उनसे मेरो ना वितरण में मालूम के ना कितने जीव मानते हैं ना वहाँ से And this is a fact because there are many witnesses who could witness to this truth. मैं मैं कहता हूँ नियम साथ क्यों सुबह आरंचे हैं मैं सुबह आरंचे के ना तो दाव से लोग के पुराण में गुड़ाक आए इना जैसे ना करना हुआ This is a historical fact. मैं कहता हूँ नियम साथ क्� जेसुस आंसर के मालूम के नेकिटी में तेर में तमा आप ही तुम नांसे समगा आधे नेकिटी लसी के नवा मालूम के। We will have life for all eternity। ये कहीं साथ दाव से आप ही लाभ लाती बनो आ सदा काल जीवने आप ही जीवित है समग्र संबंध वेलाती बनो सदा काल जीवने ना जेसुस आंसर के मालूम के नेकिटी में। That's why we will not lose hope. Even in a pandemic or whatever might come our way. एक निशा याद है इलिवान तेरा कितनुआ मना लोग के ना मना विनाश या क्वासंग के तेरा आवाज अपे बाला पुरोत्तुए नेतिवेंद्र याने ना. I mean maybe you lost some loved ones back home through this pandemic. समारे इट अपे याद रे के ना प्रेम के ना कावर या अपे पावले नेतिवेंद्र पुलवा. Maybe you face many other difficulties. ये वाके में नेतंग हो बे जीविते विविधा करी टवडी अमारु देवालो बेटा हम बेटे पुला बे जीवी नक मार के दी। I want to encourage you. There's hope in Jesus. ये कनिसा ये अवस्था आवन वाले दी ओ बेटा किया नक अमिती दायर मत करने बो मावे अब बेटा बाला पुरुत्वा ती बेना से नका कापी। The enemy doesn't have the last word. Only Jesus has. मतलब तब आगे ना यक्ष्य टा अवस्था ना वचने ना अवस्था ना तीन दो दिन जाने ओब and there's victory in Jesus. Victory over death. And that's why our gospel is really good news. Sorry, I... I uh, was tra trying your patience a little bit. Uh, my message was a bit long. <laughs> but, you know, I feel like it would be important to respond to this message. So, just where you are, maybe just speak with Jesus just now. And thank him for this life he has given you. If you have lost hope lately, ask him for this new hope he has. He is a God of life, not of death. I want to encourage you to take a new hold of that. So trust in a personal prayer, respond to this message wherever you feel God has been speaking to you this morning.